Who are the best 10 players on the Mets roster right now? We're going to rank them on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Ficklestein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Ficklestein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right on new customers are going to get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now we're ranking the top 10 players on the Mets roster right now on today's show. And I will say that at the end of each season, a really good way to see who is the most valuable player on the team is to look at wins above replacement. I like to use fan graphs. And I think when we look at the wins above replacement leaders from the Mets the last two years, for one, it shows you who's been the most valuable, but two, it shows you the difference between a 75 win team last year and 101 win team in 2022. So you start off with just how many good players do you have? And we're ranking 10 guys today because I wanted to see how many above average contributors you can count on. And it's got me nervous about this season. So we'll get to that a little bit later when we round out this top 10. Trying to find those last couple of guys was tough for me. But looking at the last two years, it's drastic the difference in contributions that the Mets got. So 2022, the Mets had 13 players who gave them at least two wins above replacement. A lot of guys were good. A lot of guys were, you know, pulling that rope in the right direction toward being a really good baseball team. Last year, how many do you think they had? They had six. Six players that gave them just two wins above replacement. You had Francisco Lindor at six wins above replacement, Brandon Nimmo at 4.3, Kodai Sang at 3.4, Pete Alonso at 2.8. Francisco Alvarez at 2.7, and Jeff McNeil at 2.6. And that's it. You compare that to the year prior, not only did they have 13 guys who gave them at least two wins above replacement, they had 11 who gave them at least two and a half wins above replacement. And they had three guys who gave them at least a five-win season. You had Lindor at 6.6, McNeil at 5.7, Nimmo at 5.2, Scherzer at 4.4, Pete Alonso at 3.8, Edwin Diaz at three wins above replacement, that's right there, six guys over three wins. And then you had Marte at 2.9, Chris Bassett at 2.8, Mark Canna at 2.7, Taiwan Walker at 2.6, and Carlos Carrasco at 2.5. Can you believe that Taiwan Walker pitched to a sub-3.5 ERA in 2022? And Carrasco, sub-4? That's what you need to be a really good team. Okay, so that's just sort of a baseline to start with, to give you an idea of you know, sort of the rankings of the top 10 in the last two years, right? There's one guy that's always at the top, and that's where we're going to start today. I will say I'm not going to be completely beholden to F4 because if I was, you know, Pete Alonzo would fall pretty far down this list. You know, you look at 2022. If we went strictly by wins above replacement, that season, Pete Alonzo would have been the, what, the fifth best player? You'd have Lindor, McNeil, Nimmo, Scherzer. Yeah, Alonzo would have been fifth. But in that season, Pete Alonso hit 40 home runs and drove in 131. The reason why his wins above replacement is worse is because of how the defense knocks him. But overall, even with the great season that Jeff McNeil had, batting title champ, the great season that Brandon Nimmo had in a contract year, if I look back at that 2022 Mets team, the best two players on that team in my eyes would be Francisco Lindor and Pete Alonso, And I'd probably put Scherzer third, if I'm being completely honest. So we're not going to just do this based on F war alone, but you do have to take some pretty um, glaring F war numbers into account. The guy that's consistently the best player on this team the last couple of years. And we got to put him right back there. The best player on the New York Mets right now is Francisco Lindor. And it's not even close. I know there's Mets fans that still don't appreciate Lindor. 
I don't know what you're watching. What I see is a guy that's giving you exceptional defense at the most important position on the field, the shortstop, which is invaluable to a team. That helps your pitching staff so much to have a vacuum over at shortstop that's making all the routine plays, that makes the exceptional plays. Lindor, you know, being your starting shortstop is huge for this team. And then offensively, the guy has been contributing. You know, 30-30 season, getting to 100 RBIs in 2022. He's a really good player, a player that doesn't get appreciated enough by Mets fans, in my opinion. You look at the last two years, to have two six-win seasons in a row. How many guys in Major League Baseball do you think have done that? In 2022 and 2023, eclipsed six wins. They're the best players in the game. Got to do it, right? And there was not one of the best players, is what some of his detractors would say. Is he a top five player in baseball? No way, right? Well, let's look at the last two years. How many guys have done just that? Eclipse six wins. Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, Francisco Lindor. Now, if you include pitching and hitting, Shohei Otani as well. But just offensively, Otani had a 3.8 win season in 2022. So you want to include Otani and you combine them both, of course. He's the best player in baseball when you do that. And this past year, he was the best hitter in baseball. But just if you're setting Otani aside, it's Betts, Freeman, Lindor. Now, I will put a caveat there. Aaron Judge put up a 5.3 F4 season playing 106 games last year. And then he put up an 11.6 F4 season to lead baseball in 2022. So Judge deserves mention. If you combine the two seasons, look at the F war leaderboards in the last two years. It's Judge at 16.9 wins above replacement. It's Freeman at 15. It's Betts at 14.8. And then it's Lindor at 12.6. Again, that's just offensively. If you combine Otani's numbers, different conversation. Beyond that, you got Jose Ramirez at 11.5, Dansby Swanson at 11.4, Julio Rodriguez at 11.3, Jordan Alvarez at 11.2, and Manny Machado at 11. That's your top nine players in baseball. Otani slides in, of course, you know, probably atop that list. That gives you your top 10 in the last two years. So people who think that Lindor is not worth the contract, he, he shouldn't be getting paid $34.1 million per season. Uh, didn't think that he deserved a 10-year deal. Thinks he's overrated. I'm telling you, he's properly rated as one of, if not the best shortstop in baseball. I think a lot of rankings going to this season will have Seager 1 and Lindor 2 because Seager had an absolutely monster year. But if you were to then expand that outlook the last two to three years, because of health and because of defense, Lindor should be considered the best shortstop in baseball. I'm not mad at putting Seager one. To be completely honest, at JustBaseball.com, we just recently um, went through, we ranked all of our top tens, and I ranked Seager number one. So uh, I'm not going to just you know be a biased Mets fan and say it's definitely Lindor, but I could absolutely make the argument for Lindor. So when it comes to this team next year and probably for the next five years, until they add you know a Juan Soto or somebody else, which – Big down on them being able to do that. This guy's your best player. To me, that's an argument that's cut and dry. Now, rounding out the top five is a lot tougher. And that's what we're going to get to next. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. There's a few weeks left in the NFL playoffs, which means there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers are going to get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet, that's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use. There's so many different ways that you can take advantage of those bonus bets. You got same game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find popular parlays. Every night, there's NBA games going on, so there's always some parlays to choose from, whether that's you know betting on three different NBA games or if you want to combine you know, a player result with a team result. So a player's over, under on points, rebounds, assists, three-pointers made with the team result. You can find all of that there in the Parlay Hub. And again, remember, you place a $5 bet, you get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. So if you want to get in on the action, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner, the NFL. 
So we got Francisco Lindor holding down that top spot as the best player on the New York Mets heading into the 2024 season. But who is number two? Might surprise you, but I did not pick Pete Alonso. For me, the second best player on the Mets right now is Brandon Nimmo. Okay, Brandon Nemo, what I love about him last couple of years is consistent production. Consistency goes a long way with me. A okay, guy has gotten in 150 plus games the last two years. You know what his batting average has been? It's exactly 274 for two straight seasons. You know how rare that is, how hard that is to do, to put up the exact same batting average two years in a row. Along with that, his on-base percentage, basically the same. 367 in 2022, 363 last year. So really good for a leadoff hitter. Although I think there could be some discourse about if Brandon Nimmo continues as power output, if he should slide down in the lineup because he's not really driving in a ton of runs. And last year he had 24 home runs. The year before he had 16 home runs. He might be able to drive in some more runs if he's not that leadoff man. Then again, a 360 OBP is pretty good in that leadoff spot. He also bumped his slug last year, 30 points, when he hit those 24 home runs. We talk about WRC Plus a lot on this show. It's weighted runs created plus. It's an all-encompassing stat that measures hitters based on a league average of 100. He had a 133 WRC Plus in his contract year in 2022. The first year of the eight-year contract, he puts up a 130 WRC Plus. Again, consistency. He had a 5.2 F4 2022, 4.3 last year. Put together, that's nine and a half wins over two years. Really good production. MLB uh, Network did their top tens, or they're doing their top tens right now. They had Brandon Nemo as a left fielder because I guess Harrison Bader is now the Mets center fielder, according to them. I think he's going to play both. I know for just baseball, we put Nemo in center field. Um, I just don't know if Bader's absolutely the starting center fielder on this team. I think he's going to have a little bit of a timeshare going on there. But regardless, they had him as the second best left fielder in baseball behind Jordan Alvarez, who I think is more of a DH anyway. So you look at that for, for what it is. You could say that Brandon Nimmo might be the best left fielder in baseball. He's going to be really good this year. If he does play in left field, I do wonder how that defense is going to either play up or down. You could say, oh, it's easier to play in a corner. But also for Nimmo, you know, he is a natural center fielder. It did take him time to get you know better at the position. We, we saw the defense really tick up. Over the last couple of years, I get that. And last year, you know, you look at some of the stats, they might say he was slightly below average. Overall, though, the reads are easier in center field. So I do wonder how he's going to handle that move to the corner. I think he'll be fine, but I just wonder when it comes strictly to a war perspective, what that's going to do for him. But going into the season and ranking the best players on this team, to me, Nimmo's number two. Now, Alonzo comes in at number three. And, you know, it's crazy to me that. He hit 46 home runs last year, drove in 118. And you can make an argument it was the worst season of his career because he hit 217 and only got on base the 318 clip, was way too streaky, went into big slumps that cost the team games. That's why I put Nimmo above him. Again, consistency. But again, this is preseason rankings, not predictions. If I had to predict who the best player on this team is going to be this year, it's probably Lindor. But I put Alonzo at a close second because I think he's going to be the best player offensively by country mile. If he actually doesn't get that extension, this is a contract year, I think Pete is going to drag this team to the playoffs, and I think he's going to put up a ridiculous season. But that is a uh, story for another day or for another podcast, I should say. Alonzo's number three. I think the top three on this team are pretty clear. I think Lindor is pretty obviously the best player, and then you can make your argument either way for Nemo or Alonzo. Beyond that, it gets a little more dicey. So to round out the top five, we got two pitchers. It's the ace of this team and the closer. Kodai Sanga, Edwin Diaz. And I went back and forth on this one because I think Edwin Diaz, you know, th that function that he provides you as this elite closer that's going to hold on to all those games. I, I can make the, the argument, certainly, that he is the most important pitcher on this team because they're going to need to win every single one-run game if they want to be a playoff team. And Diaz is going to be massive with that. The guy put up a 1.31 ERA the last time we saw him. He struck out over 50% of the batters he faced. He was remarkable. A three-win season for a closer is insane. Last year, nobody got to three wins from the relief pitchers. And 
I believe there's only like four guys that even got uh, two wins above replacement as relief pitchers. But with all of that said, I got Diaz four, Kodai Senga, uh, or excuse me, I got Diaz five. <laughs> Kodai Senga has to be number four on this team because he's the ace and because he's going to pitch double the innings that Edwin Diaz will. So my one through five, it's Lindor, Nimmo, Alonzo, Senga, Diaz. And, and honestly, if this team is going to reach you know, the absolute apex, I, Senga has to be much better than Edwin Diaz when it comes to wins above replacement. He's got to put up a big, big year. Last year, 2.98 ERA. Um, that was great. If you did that again, it, right now, if you put it in front of me, you can sign this line and you'll get that exact same ERA again. I, I would sign it. Even though I think he can actually be better than that because he was in the second half, you can't you know quibble about an ERA under three, even if it's 2.98. The thing for me is the innings pitched. Last year, 166 in a third innings pitched. Again, in some respects, if you put that in front of me, part of me would want to sign it because that tells me that he's not going to you know, only pitch 100 innings. But with this team and how thin this rotation is, can Kodai Senga get to 180 innings? That's what would really change things for the Mets. And I don't even necessarily think it's you know starting every fifth day. I think they can keep him in a pseudo six-man rotation. I don't know if they're going to go to a straight six-man. I don't think they have enough um, good starting pitchers to do it. But you can have bullpen games. You can you know manipulate off days. There's ways to get Senga his rest. And I think how he gets those innings, it's going out and giving you seven or eight when he when he does make his starts. And I think you're going to see a lot of that this year. Like I, I love Kodai Senga to just hand the ball to Edwin Diaz at times. Um, that that's going to be really big for this team. That'll be huge to help the rest of the bullpen out. So uh, I think if you look at the top five of this team, that's pretty set in stone for me. There was nobody else on this roster that even considered in the top five. Uh, you know, to me, the best three players on this team are definitely Lindor, Nemo, and Alonzo. And, you know, Sanga and Edwin Diaz are just so valuable in their particular roles, especially considering what's behind them this year. Now, six through 10. <laughs> it's a lot harder to figure out six through 10. I'll break down the rest of my top 10 list in just a minute. First, though, another word from our sponsors. Before we finish off my ranking of the top 10 players on the Mets right now, I want to acknowledge that this was not my idea. It actually came from the Locked On Mets Insiders. This is our texting service where some of the most devoted listeners of the show can send me messages. They can ask me questions. And a little while back, I asked for some show topics. Someone suggested that I rank the top players on the Mets. I jotted it down. I hadn't gotten around to it. And finally, I decided, you know what? Let's rank some players today. So I appreciate getting the idea from the Locked On Mets Insiders. If you want to be part of that community, you can find the link in the episode description or go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. Now, the debate between six and seven was really hard for me, okay? I think if you look beyond the top seven players in the Mets, it, the list falls off a cliff, and we'll get to that. But six and seven was hard between Jeff McNeil and Francisco Alvarez. These two guys last year, they were basically neck and neck when it came to wins above replacement. With McNeil, we've seen a ceiling that we don't know if Alvarez can reach. What he did in 2022 was awesome. Okay, the guy you know, played gold glove defense for, for my money. He, I think he should have won the gold glove for utility player. He should have won it last year. Was that was that, actually that, that come in last year or two years ago? I can't even remember now. Regardless, he played great defense uh, at multiple positions. He won a batting title. He was an all-star. Near six win season. Jeff McNeil is a really good player. I put Francisco Alvarez six on this list because I think Francisco Alvarez is a star. And I actually decided I'm going to talk about Alvarez specifically on the show tomorrow because I think he's going to be the best catcher in baseball this year, not named Adley Rutschman. That's what I think. Because last year, getting his first full taste of big league action. He was amazing defensively. And if he can do that again and be a little more consistent on the offensive side, his value is going to go through the roof. I remember Arm Layton, uh, co-founder of just baseball.com, who comes on my show periodically. We were talking about Alvarez. I think it was before the season last year. And he said, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, 
It might have actually been when Alvarez came up. He said, I think that Alvarez can uh, give you Mike Zanino type production that year with the Rays where he had the 30 plus home runs and just gave him good defense. I think he can do that. And that's exactly what he did last year, but that was just scratching the surface. If he's less streaky, you know, if he hits 250 instead of 209, if he, you know, taps into that power more, because I do think there is 40 home run power in the tank for him. I don't know if he'll reach that next year, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. And he gets on base, you know, above 300 this year, maybe closer to 320, 330. He hits for a higher average. He's going to take a leap. And if he's still playing that great defense, he's going to be very valuable. So I think Alvarez, with that star power, with that high ceiling, with the floor that he even brought as being a really good defensive catcher, to me, he is the sixth best player on this team. And that rounds it out to Jeff McNeil at seven. I don't need to spend too much more time on him. We did a whole show on him yesterday. Really good player. Really good player. And when you compare him to the rest of the guys on this list, there was no one I could have put above Jeff McNeil. Number eight. We're going to have to put a starting pitcher back on this list, but who do you put? Do you put Luis Severino and just ignore last season? Bet on the ceiling? That's what the Mets hope for. They want Severino to be a two this year. I don't know if he can do it, but that's what they're hoping for. Do you put Sean Manaya, who I think has, you know, a decent amount of upside on this contract and a relatively high floor? Like, is he going to give you at least a four or five ERA as a back end starter? I think so. Could he give you a sub three five if what he showed down the stretch with the increase in velocity, with the implementation of a sweeper? Can, can he you know, really utilize his arsenal at, at you know, a peak level performance in his second year coming off driveline and give you way more than I think you would expect on the surface? Possibly. But I go with Jose Quintana at number eight because I just trust Quintana more than those two guys. You know, I, I think. Severino has the highest ceiling. I've said that before. And I think Manaya has a higher ceiling than Quintana. And I also think that Manaya has a higher floor than Severino. But I just trust the floor of Quintana. I think he's going to be fine this year. He had a 3 5 7 ERA and 13 starts with the Mets last year. Coming off, you know, not having your typical spring training ramp up. He got hurt with that weird rim injury in spring training, was out for large portions of the season. Had to just come in and you know, we saw you know a couple years back, 2021, Carlos Carrasco with a similar, uh, not similar injury, but a similar return as far as when he came back into the fold. And he was just a disaster. Um, he was a disaster last year too. But then we saw a you know, year after that though, in 2022, year after the injury for Carrasco, he put together a solid season as a veteran. I think that Quintana is going to give you at least that, right? At least what Carrasco did in 2022, which was, a sub four ERA, um, not by much, but still a sub four ERA and a lot of innings pitch. I, I think Quintana is going to do that. I think he's going to take the ball every fifth day for you. He's your number two starter. He, he's the guy that I think right now, if you had to tell me who leads the Mets in innings pitched, you know, Quintana is sort of that sneaky bet. Like if someone actually put odds on that, you know, Kodai Senga is going to have the, the best odds. Like he's supposed to be the odds on favorite to do it. But Quintana is sort of that sneaky guy where I could see him starting on on you know normal rest more frequently and just just giving you a lot of really solid innings. So I, I think to me Quintana is the second best starter on this team right now. He's the number two in this rotation. That's why I haven't no, have, have him. Excuse me, jeez, have him <laughs> at number eight. Now the final two, I could just be lazy, put the other starting pitchers in here, but I don't think that they're in this top ten. So at number nine, Starling Marte. I'm buying the bounce back. I am. I think he's healthy. I think he's going to have a good year. I, I, at this point, believe that the Mets are avoiding adding a DH, not only because they want to see what Mark Vientos has. I think it's because they buy into to Starling Marte's health, but also want to protect him. Like I think they believe that Starling Marte will give you a, a level of offensive production that is similar to what you'd get in that DH market. Now, he's not going to give you the same power, but just offensive value. He's going to do it with speed. He's going to bring some pop. He's going to manufacture some runs. And I, I think they are hoping that they can 
stick him at DH 40, 50 times this year, be able to keep him off his feet, keep him healthy, and maybe get you know a, a big part of that investment they made in him back. They got a lot of it that first year. I think this is the other year to get the most out of Starling Marte. And he's the guy that can play at an all-star level. And of the other guys on this list or on this roster, you can't say that about a lot of them. So for me, Marte comes in at number nine. Number 10 was really tough. Could have gone back to the well with one of those starting pitchers. Could have put Jorge Lopez, just kidding, the Mets bullpen, not looking great right now. Can they sign a reliever? But really, there's a lot of different options you could have stuck at this 10 spot, right? To me, I just felt like what was the skill I trusted most on this Mets roster? The above average skill that's going to translate to helping the Mets win baseball games. And that's right with Harrison Bader at number 10. Which I think says a lot about the state of this Mets roster. I, I do. You can make an argument, or you cannot make an argument for Beatty or Vientos because we're ranking. But you can hope, I would say, that one of Beatty or Mark Vientos is going to put together a great offensive season, and they're going to be comfortably in this top ten list of the best players on this team by the end of the year. You know that that Beatty's going to figure it out at third base. You can't rank him there now. Same thing goes with Vientos. Um, you know you can hope for one of those starters that I talked about to have a great season. And really, I think that's another thing that needs to happen, right? At least two of Quintana, Manaya, and Severino need to be among your top 10 players this year if you're going to have a nice season. They need to get value out of that rotation. But I can't just rank them there. Harrison Bader's defense to me is something that I know is going to be there. Now, I guess the health is the problem with it, but if Harrison Bader is healthy and in the lineup and starting in center field for hundred plus games, defense alone is going to be worth, you know, two and a half wins. Now, can he find anything offensively? Can he hold his own against right-handed pitching at all? Because there's also a world where he doesn't, he's awful against righties and he becomes a platoon bat. He's just starting as left-handed pitching and Brandon Nimmo is a starting center fielder. We'll see how it all shakes out. But I think when you look back, right, to that 2022 Mets team, again, I'll reiterate that top 10 list of the most valuable players that year. Lindor, McNeil, Nimmo, Scherzer, Alonzo, Diaz, Marte. There was seven guys that played at an all-star level that year. They weren't all all-stars, but seven guys that played at an all-star level. And Chris Bassett. If the Mets could get any starter not named Kodai Senga to give them Chris Bassett 2022 level production, that would be an unbelievable thing for this team. Mark Canna was really good that year. Taiwan Walker and Carlos Carrasco gave you solid innings. Did I believe in either of them to contribute when it came postseason time? Nope. But did they help you get through the regular season by eating up a ton of of innings and helping you win a lot of games. Yes. And then you know, even looking at Jacob DeGrom on that team, who only played you know, for, you know, made 11 starts and then won a playoff game. They are a far cry right now from the 2022 Mets. A lot can happen this year. I think they can be a scrappy team that wins 85 games or 86 games and makes it into the playoffs. I think it could be a lot of fun to watch with those, reframed expectations but the talent level on this team right now to try to fill out a top 10 it's really not there and that's disappointing and that's why i think so many people want to see them go out and get a jorge soler so i have to go back right now so the top of my head and say where would jorge soler rank on this list six six or seven right I mean, going into the year, you definitely think that he'd have a better chance to have a monster season offensively than Francisco Alvarez, as much as I believe in Alvarez. So yeah, I'd probably say six. You know, if you were to go out and get, even if they got David Robertson, I would probably put him above Harrison Bader, for example. If they got Ryan Stanek, I might put him above Harrison Bader. I don't know, just because it'd be nice to have a setup man on this team. 
If you try to go to like a top 15 on this roster, I mean, what will we even do? So I, I do understand the thirst for more talent right now, but I think their hope is there's talent on this roster that's hidden that we can't see right now that's going to break out in a big way. So we'll see if it does. Uh, on to Marshall, like I, I mentioned earlier, I actually want to do another dive on Francisco Alvarez because uh, I think he's going to have a monster season. I am. I know on yesterday's show I talked about doing uh, top 10 prospects. I want to spend a little more time making my list. I tried to go through it today. I want to get some more data. So we're going to do that later on. There's still plenty of offseason left um, to, to make that type of a ranking. Hopefully next Friday, I'll put something together for at least the top five. But tomorrow, we're going to focus on Alvarez. If you don't, don't want to miss that show, you're listening right now. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. I would love to get over 8,000 subs by opening day. So I appreciate all of you. Hit that subscribe uh, if you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, pitch me some show topics. I'd love to hear them. You can find the link in the episode description or go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. You can follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. And if you want to go over and see some great content just covering everything in the world of sports right now, head over to Locked On Sports Today, the first ever 24-7 streaming channel that covers everything with our local experts from each team and our league-wide experts from each league. You can find Locked On Sports Today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.